I've got a wee confession to make before I start. I'm an engineer. And uh, I've been hearing all kinds of things about engineers, as if we're part of the problem. No, we're part of the solution. And we have to be, otherwise it won't work. And uh, I think that's, that's a very important issue for us. I'm going to talk about marine energy and then have a particular think as to where we go from here, because life's changed a wee bit in the past uh, couple of years, or a couple of weeks. Um, as far as we're concerned, this really started in the 1970s, uh, certainly in Europe. And it really rose in Edinburgh, Stephen Salter, who was my PhD supervisor, um, not in the 70s, I hasten to add. Um, Lisbon, uh, Professor Falcao and uh, Trondheim, Professor Falness. It really it rose from three different European centres. There are, were others, but these were the, the principal developments uh, were. I always like to point out this fresh-faced young man on the right, Stephen Salter. He's still active in marine renewable energy. When I was head of engineering at Edinburgh University, Stephen was still there, still coming along and telling me what to do, and telling me that I used to make the same mistakes when I was his student. And uh, I no doubt he's doing the same with my successor at the moment, as we go forward. And uh, it was an interesting time. We believed we were going to solve the world's energy crisis. I didn't start until 1980, so I was a wee bit later than the others. And just to prove it, there I am. Uh, year one of my PhD, breaking absolutely every health and safety regulation <laughs> imaginable. I was also breaking a few fashion statements as well. I actually had bell-bottom trousers. Uh, you can't really see it, but I had a Mexican moustache. And my hair, which was tied back, was actually shoulder length as well. Stephen was holding the camera, so he should have known better than to let me do that. So it's, uh, there's quite a few of us been in it for a, a long time. So a gradual realisation, you become one of the old men of the sector. Uh, a good friend and colleague at the back there, Ian Masters. I won't include you as one of the old men of the sector. Just one of the, <laughs> one of the, the main driving forces. So you'll escape from that. But there's a, a feeling that it was very much European, and it wasn't. Um, if you went somewhat east, at the time when we were playing around in wave tanks, that thing was generating electricity into the grid in Japan. It's called Kaimi. It's a, a converted bulk carrier, converted into a floating wave power device. It worked. Remember, we were still playing around with numbers at the time. They were generating electricity. Japanese wave power program nosedived, as of course did ours at the, the time. But we have to give credit for them. They took a different approach. They didn't take the approach of let's be very academic about it. They just went ahead and did it. An interesting lesson, I think, for the way forward. Um, into the 1980s, however, everything went wrong. We had a very innovative wave programme which had public-private money in it. It came to the end, 19th of March 1982, publication of the Wave Energy Select Committee report, <coughs> which basically says there's no future Gas is the future. Nuclear is the future. I remember that date because I had my 12-month PhD progress meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, about half an hour after <coughs> the publication. I didn't know that had come out. And the first question I got thrown at me, why are you doing a PhD in wave power because it's not going anywhere? And I thought a really good impression of a goldfish. <laughs> um, there's a few people we give credit for keeping going. One, again, another friend and colleague of mine, Trevor Whitaker, Queen's University, Belfast, he kept it going. Just out of pure stubbornness, he refused to accept that wave power wasn't going anywhere. He said, the waves are out there, let's tackle it. And he was installing the next real big step forward in terms of metal in the water, the, uh, the original Queen's University wave power device in Isla. Uh, that was subsequently demolished and replaced by a much larger uh, device in the same similar location. There was quite a lot of unfunded <coughs> research at this time. Um, and that also kept it going in the, the background. Actually, Mrs Thatcher got me with the uh, killing wave power. So I then went to work for the Scientific Civil Service. So she managed to get me twice. <laughs> I'm not bitter. <laughs> okay, into the 90s. Life changed a wee bit. Renewed funding, a renewed funding environment. Never mind just renewed funding. Most of it from Europe, most of it European Commission funding. Just let that one sink in. <laughs> just now. The, the Eiley uh, Trevor's Eiley device kept on going, showed that it could be done. Uh, another 
friend and colleague of mine, Peter Frankel. The marine community is quite small, we all know each other. We've all been through the rough times. That goes for the industrialists and academics. Peter Frankel <coughs> tested this little device here in Loch Linney, near Fort William. He showed that tidal current power could work in our waters. Again, at a time when people were saying this is not significant. I remember being told when I moved from the scientific civil service into academia, being told, forget about marine renewable energy, it'll kill your career. Interesting, I heard that being said to another academic this week. Time comes around. But there was, gradually, industrialists started to develop an interest. They thought there might be some way here. That device, interestingly, was uh, paid for by Scottish Nuclear. No longer exists. The nuclear industry paid for the first serious tidal current energy project in this country, often forgotten. Time goes forward into the 2000s, or whatever we call them, the zeros. Um, new funding mechanisms arose. Uh, funding for R&D, the Supergen programme. I was research director for the Supergen programme for years, now, so it, uh, it felt like to fund in research in the universities. There was funds to, for device development. There was revenue support. Mechanisms put in place by which if you could generate electricity, you could recover costs from the sale of electricity. Um, some really innovative ventures, European Marine Energy Centre, uh, I'll say a wee bit more about that. We started gradually to see the testing of commercial size devices as we move forward. Another period of excitement when we thought we were going to solve the world's energy crisis. And here's just some of the machines that emerged out of the last decade and into this decade. Palamis, top left hand corner, company now gone bankrupt. This is uh, a Finnish company, uh, Welly Oi. Um, I could take about five hours explaining how it works. It's fascinating. I love it. It's my favourite way for a device. So I'll try not to. Um, the bottom left hand corner, the aquamarine device, now gone bankrupt. It's a common theme that starts to develop with the people who were brave enough to stick their necks out in this era as we went forward. In Tidal, Tidal's a wee bit different. We're still seeing success within Tidal for a variety of reasons. Um, the, it's a very innovative device. Sorry, Ian, I haven't got a picture of your device. <laughs> I apologise. Uh, I realised that about 20 minutes ago. It was an obvious uh, missing one. Um, there's actually some similarity between some of these devices. There's rather more commonality of design concept in Tidal. And I think this is part of the main issues why this has kept going <coughs> as we've gone forward. Um, but I'll say a wee bit more about that. This one's quite an interesting one. This is the uh, Scott Renewable device. That's going in the water now, as, we, as I stand here. Um, and I think I do make mention of it later on as we we'll look to the, to the future. But what are the issues that we're tackling? Weave and Tidal, there are similarities in that they're both in the sea, basically. The actual engineering of them is in many ways quite different, and I don't know if this is always uh, picked up. Wave devices have to be designed to get energy out of relatively small waves, and they have to be able to survive the big ones. That's a challenge. The oil industry, the shipping industry, divide, designs their technology not to absorb the energy of the waves. Quite different challenges. How do we do that? Wave devices produce very noisy electricity. How can you smooth that in an effective way? And I'm not going to answer that now. Um, then, particularly the floating devices, how do you get the electricity from a floating device that's getting thrown about all over the place, perhaps a few kilometres to dry land, even before you connect it into the grid? These were challenges 30 odd years ago when I started. They're still challenges now. Move to tidal. Installation. You're putting technology. I'm really talking about tidal current here. I'll say a wee bit more about tidal barrage, tidal lagoons later. Um, you're putting devices into very energetic areas. You might only have 15 minutes of relative calm. I'll say relative calm. Anybody who believes slack water is a benign environment has never actually looked at the sea in detail. About 15 years ago, I put a 150 kilowatt tidal device in. Despite the fact they've been working on turbulence for 20 years, I learned more than 10 minutes about marine turbulence than I had 20 years previously. How do we get the technology into the water without breaking it and without killing somebody and without costing the air? Once it's in, how do we maintain it 
Do we lift it out for maintenance? Or do we try and do the maintenance in situ? Again, we're still trying to answer these questions. Plus, this is an awful environment. But if it wasn't for the fact that I'm a marine hydrodynamicist, I would really hate the sea. <laughs> How do we tackle this? But again, I'm not going to answer it. Environmental concerns. Artificial energy production causes changes to the environment. How do you quantify that? I've just sort of picked three areas. Uh, wave power, uh, things people forget. The wave action contributes to the dynamism of the coastline. <coughs> you disturb habitat, habitats of marine animals during installation and operation. You alter the whole energy pattern of the coastline. So do coastal golf courses. I don't see that at all. <laughs> coastal golf courses should be banned. They do so much damage to the large scale coastal or physical environment, it's not true. If I said that at home, I'd be hung. Tidal currents. There's things live in the sea. Fish, cetaceans, the lot. It's a challenge to the equipment and it's a challenge to that life. I've seen devices of tidal devices that I would call seal slicers. And there's a whole category of device I think should be banned. And you can ask me about it later, because I'm not going to say it in public because I might be sued. Um, flow impedance modification. This is really what I've done, spent most of my career looking at. Um, what happens when you try to, when you slow the water down to take energy out of it? It's, the world changes. How does it change? And it's not as easy as many people think it is. It's a very complex issue. And again, habitat uh, disturbance. Plus the social and economic environment. You're not the only people using the sea. And some developers and some academics seem to forget that one. So, wave. I put this one in red, the onshore sediment movement. It's a planning issue, really. Get the planning right, get the science right. Tidal current, the impact of entanglement. It's design. I've already mentioned there's at least one class of device I think is unacceptable as we go forward. So where is the research now? What is the research that still needs to be done? We've been doing this for nearly 40 years and there's still questions we don't know the answer for. Can we get the energy from the waves safely, economically, and that's the challenge. I think we can do it safely. We can probably do it sustainably. We haven't got the economics right. Then there's how much energy is there and where is it? I know how much energy there is in a particular site, but how do we establish the acceptable limits for extraction, environmental and social limitations? Um, and there's some low-hanging fruit out there, which is sometimes missed as we, we look at the big sources. If we look at the energy, I'm going to put a big caution on this one. We think that we could probably install about 50 gigawatts capacity of wave energy technology, according to the best present estimates. That's not the theoretical limit. The theoretical limit's vastly more than that. But what we think we could do with some technology that we could put our hands on now. Tidal, probably a fifth of that, using technology that uh, is available to us now. Um, Tidal, there's a whole pile of garbage published in Tidal Resort, mm -hmm. and it really annoys me at times. I still read fantasy documents on the Tidal Energy Resource, and we can't have that at all. Um, it's held us back. Anybody who sounds too confident about their estimates probably hasn't looked at the problem closely enough. We can do it for a particular site, but when people start talking about the national resource, forget it. When they start talking about the continental or the world resource, they're in fairyland. However, even with the cautious provisos, the energy is still out there. It's just that we haven't got our hands on it yet. As a resource, the machines, we started in the 70s. Wave power, we're still optimising the design. We're still optimising the control systems. We're still not there. And again, fixing something like moorings. We're still aren't <coughs> sure of the best way of mooring a floating wave power device. In general, we can do it specifically. And reliability of materials, build huge question marks over this. Tidal, converter principle, I think we're there actually. I could 
pick up a book that tells me how to design a turbine. And it might not be the most efficient turbine in the world, but it'll be good enough. That's not the real challenge. <coughs> it's not the conversion of the energy. Again, it's the fixings, the moorings, the installation, and environmental impact. That are the serious machine-related issues that we're still talking. Hanging over this is things like control as well. I'm a control engineer. If I talk to a control engineer, sorry, a mechanical engineer, um, I tell them that I'm looking at an environment which is uh, non-stationary, non-linear, and non-ergodic, in which case they tend to be scared, because these are the words that they hate. So economics cost us too much, far too high to be attractive for conventional commercial investment. Onshore wind, yeah. Onshore wind, in some ways you do the sums, is actually the cheapest electricity you've got. The trouble is it's intermittent, so you need backup, and that's where the economics goes to the street. But in principle, onshore wind can be economic uh, with uh, a, a, as part of a, a broader uh, development strategy for energy. We're very far away from that in marine renewables. We need to understand all aspects of the design stage. We need to be thinking about all of these issues when we design the technology. Not designing, we then think, how do we get it in the water? I've still seen devices that have been designed along that way. Uh, prototype assessment is vital. Once we've got a big machine, that's not the end of the story. You have to test it, test it virtually to death. That's why EMEC was designed. Other test sites, Portugal, Ireland, now in Wales. Um, I use the rather pompous title of closing the design, development, deployment loop. Uh, I keep saying it, sometimes I actually have to think what I mean by it. Places like EMEC are absolutely vital for this. I was a, a director of EMEC for 10 years. I stood down last year. Um, 10 years was long enough for anybody. It's a fantastic location, but it's remote. Even I will admit it takes a long time to get to work. To go from my office to work is a three hour drive and a two hour ferry sailing. Uh, and I'm based in Inverness. So, We've got problems coming. However, it's not all uh, negative. The Maygen project, one of the big hopes for tidal energy, tidal current energy. This is in the Pentland Firth. It's in the inner sound of the Pentland Firth. Just in, about there. These are two of my campuses. I straddle the Pentland Firth. Um, Maygen, between the, the coastline and this island here, uh, Stroma. Um, ultimate economic potential, if we can get the sums right, it's probably about 400 megawatts capacity, which is amazing. Machines, yeah, machines are going in now, which uh, is fantastic as we go forward. Great thing about Maygen, it's privately funded. There's little or no public funding in it, apart from the science assessments. So four machines are probably sitting on the seabed as we talk. They were being carted there in the back of a lorry. Uh, very recently. Whether we'll get to phase one, the full phase one and the full phase two, I think, will depend on other things. Other projects. This is one I just picked up last week, the Capricorn project. I'm going to go into the uh, um, the fourth estuary. It's one of, uh, one of my former PhD students. You had to see him on there. He didn't tell me he was doing this. Um, it's largely private funding as well as we move forward. Small devices, portable devices, flexible deployment. Maybe that's the future. Here in Wales, much of the attention has been on impoundment technology, either the barrages or the lagoons, such as the uh, uh, consideration of the, the Swansea Bay Lagoon. Um, but a very dynamic tidal programme here within Wales. If I was a betting man, I could see Wales overtaking Scotland in terms of the on-the-ground development of, uh, of tidal in, as we move forward. Back up to Scotland, Lashy Sound and Scott Renewables machine, the floating machine, it's going in now, it's been in, it's been out, it's going back in again, near to EMEC. Again, largely private funding. Again. Wave Energy Scotland, it's not a wave power project, it's an innovative funding model that was set up by the Scottish Government a couple of years ago. I'm one of their technical advisors. What they are doing is funding specific barrier projects, issues that have been identified as preventing economic development. So very focused 
and uh, perhaps one of the great hopes for the future in marine. So, I'm coming to the sum up. Uh, what do we need to do now? We've, we still haven't demonstrated uh, reliability. We still need to test those devices that are still on the go, and there's not many of them now, certainly in the UK. Next stage is into the array, array demonstration. I think that's perhaps less likely in the near future. Tidal, the machines are working. We need to demonstrate the costs, get the costs down. But ultimately, we need to go to the deep water sites rather than the shallow water sites we've been looking at. Public sector is vital of this. We have to create the environment where this becomes attractive for private sector investment. Create an environment in which <coughs> private sector investments have reasonable confidence of getting a return. Uh, we still haven't got clarity as to what happens when we move from renewable obligations or Scottish renewable obligations into contract for differ difference, etc. The government has been quite vague about Marine's place within this. And to the developers, no more over-optimistic case claims. We've had too many of them. To the academics, make sure the research projects are significant, not irrelevant. And that's been an issue. We need to get onto that curve. And we're not there yet. So that we can give confidence that the costs are coming down. But remember the broader environment. Uh, here we have uh, Amber Rudd. Energy and climate change. She almost killed this British wave and tidal renewable industry, industry with a speech that wasn't even government policy. She's actually very nice. I've met her. <laughs> <laughs> I still disagree with what she said. And this. The uncertainty in future funding that that poses us is enormous. For you here, it poses the threat of inability to access European funding. For us, it poses the challenge we might not even be able to access British funding. <coughs> we'll see where we go on that. Um, so uh, the quote is actually um, from uh, Nicola Sturgeon, actually, the Scottish First Minister. UK government priorities and UK exit pose challenges. Not necessarily insurmountable challenges, but challenges nonetheless. Um, one more slide. However, have a look at the UK population distribution. This one really annoys me because it leaves Orkney and Shetland off it, but everybody leaves Orkney and Shetland <laughs> off it. Um, just have a look at the distribution of coal fields in the British Isles. With the exception of Greater London, the jobs are coincident with the availability of coal. Now, I could be rather simplistic and say that's because, as I've said there, the jobs follow the energy. It's not quite true. Think about it. Okay, thank you.